Little Women has been a great favorite in America and in Britain for more than a hundred years. The author, Louisa M. Alcott, based the story very largely on her own childhood. She'd been brought up with her three sisters in the little town of Concord in New England. They were very poor, but it was an affectionate and Christian household, and the girls, as contrasting in their characters as the girls in the story, had many happy times together. The character of Joe, by the way, is based on Louisa Alcott herself. In the book, the family are called March, and they have a servant called Hannah. It's the time of the American Civil War, and the head of the family, Mr. March, is away from home, serving as a chaplain with the Union Army. Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy. We've got father and mother and each other, said Beth contentedly from her corner. The four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at the cheerful words, but darkened again as Joe said sadly. We haven't got father, and we shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say perhaps never, but each silently added it, thinking of father far away where the fighting was. Nobody spoke for a minute. Then Meg said in an altered tone, You know the reason mother proposed not having any presents this Christmas was because it is going to be a hard winter for everyone, and she thinks we ought not to spend money for pleasure when our men are suffering so in the army. We can't do much, but we can make our little sacrifices and ought to do it gladly. But I'm afraid I don't. And Meg shook her head and she thought regretfully of all the pretty things she wanted. But I don't think the little we should spend would do any good, said Joe. We've each got a dollar and the army wouldn't be much helped by our giving that. I agree not to expect anything from Mother or you, but I do want to buy the story of Undine and Sintram for myself. I've wanted it so long. I plan to spend mine on new music, said Beth with a little sigh. I shall get a nice box of Faber's drawing pencils. I really need them, said Amy. Mother didn't say anything about our money, cried Joe, and she won't wish us to give up everything. Let's each buy what we want and have a little fun sure we work hard enough to earn it. I know I do, teaching those tiresome children nearly all day when I'm longing to enjoy myself at home, began Meg in the complaining tone again. You don't have half such a hard time as I do, said Joe. How would you like to be shut up for hours with nervous, fussy old Aunt March, who keeps you trotting, is never satisfied, and worries you till you're ready to fly out of the window or cry? It's naughty to fret, said Beth. But I do think washing dishes and keeping things tidy is the worst work in the world. It makes me cross and my hands get so stiff. I can't practice the piano well at all. I don't think any of you suffer as I do, cried Amy, for you don't have to go to school with impertinent girls who plague you if you don't know your lessons and laugh at your dresses and label your father if he isn't rich. Beth turned to Meg. You said the other day you thought we were a lot happier than the King children, for they were fighting and fretting all the time in spite of their money. So I did, Beth. Well, I think we are, for though we do have to work, we make fun for ourselves, and we are a pretty jolly set, as Joe would say. Joe does use such slang words, observed Amy, with a reproving look at the long figure stretched out on the rug. Joe immediately sat up, put her hands in her pockets, and began to whistle. Don't, Joe. It's so boyish. That's why I do it, Amy. I detest rude, unladylike girls. I hate affected nimini pimini chits. Birds in their little nests agree, sang Beth, the peacemaker, with such a funny face that both sharp voices softened to a laugh, and the pecking ended for a time. <laughs> It was a comfortable old room, though the carpet was faded and the furniture very plain. A good picture or two hung on the wall, 
Books filled the recesses. Chrysanthemums and Christmas roses bloomed in the windows, and a pleasant atmosphere of home peace pervaded it. Meg was the eldest of the four. She was 16 and very pretty, being plump and fair, with large eyes, plenty of soft brown hair, a sweet mouth, and white hands, of which she was rather vain. Fifteen-year-old Joe was very tall, thin, and brown, and reminded one of a colt, for she never seemed to know what to do with her long limbs, which were very much in her way. She had a decided mouth, a comical nose, and sharp gray eyes, which appeared to see everything and were by turns fierce, funny, or thoughtful. Her long, thick hair was her one beauty, but it was usually bundled in a net to be out of her way. Elizabeth, or Beth, as everyone called her, was a rosy, smooth-haired, bright-eyed girl of 13, with a shy manner, a timid voice, and a peaceful expression, which was seldom disturbed. Amy, though the youngest, was a most important person, in her own opinion, at least. A regular snow maiden, with blue eyes and yellow hair curling on her shoulders, pale and slender, and always carrying herself like a young lady mindful of her manners. The clock struck six, and having swept up the hearth, Beth put a pair of slippers to warm. Somehow the sight of the old shoes had a good effect on the girl, for mother was coming, and everyone brightened to welcome her. Jo forgot how tired she was as she sat up to hold the slippers nearer to the blaze. They are quite worn out. Marmy must have a new pair. I thought I'd get her some with my dollar, said Beth. No, I shall, cried Amy. I'm the oldest, began Meg, but Joe cut in with a decided, I'm the man of the family now that Papa is away, and I shall provide the slippers, for he told me to take special care of Mother while he was gone. I'll tell you what we'll do, said Beth. Let's each get her something for Christmas and not get anything for ourselves. That's like you, Beth. What will we get, exclaimed Joe. Everyone thought soberly for a minute, then Meg announced, as if the idea was suggested by the sight of her own pretty hands, I shall give her a nice pair of gloves. Army shoes, best to be had, cried Joe. Some handkerchiefs, all hemmed, said Beth. I'll get a little bottle of cologne. She likes it, and it won't cost much, so I'll have some left to buy my pencils, added Amy. Glad to find you so merry, my girl, said a cheery voice at the door, and they turned to welcome a tall, motherly lady. She was not elegantly dressed, but a noble-looking woman, and the girls thought the gray cloak and unfashionable bonnet covered the most splendid mother in the whole world. Well, dearies, how have you got on today? There was so much to do that I didn't come home to dinner. Has anyone called, Beth? How is your cold, Meg? Joe, you do look tired to death. Where's my baby? Come and kiss me, Amy. While making these maternal inquiries, Mrs. March got her wet things off and her warm slippers on, and sitting down in the easy chair, drew Amy to her lap, preparing to enjoy the happiest hour of her busy day. The girls flew about, trying to make things comfortable, each in her own way. Meg arranged the tea table. Joe brought wood and set chairs, dropping, overturning, and clattering everything she touched. Beth trotted to and fro between parlor and kitchen, quiet and busy, while Amy gave directions to everyone as she sat with her hands folded. As they gathered about the table, Mrs. March said, with a particularly happy face, I've got a treat for you after supper. A quick, bright smile went round like a streak of sunshine. Beth clapped her hands, regardless of the biscuit she held, and Joe tossed her napkin in the air, crying, A letter, a letter, three cheers for father, three cheers for father. Yes, a nice long letter. He is well and thinks she shall get through the cold season better than we feared. He sends all sorts of loving wishes for Christmas and a special message to you girls. I think it was so splendid of Father to go as chaplain when he was, well, he was too old to be drafted and not strong enough for a soldier, said Meg. Don't I wish I could go as a drummer or a nurse so I could be near him and help him, exclaimed Joe. It must be very disagreeable to sleep in a tent and eat all sorts of bad-tasting things and drink out of a tin mug, sighed Amy. When will he come home, Marmy? asked Beth with a little quiver in her voice. Not for many months, dear, unless he is sick. 
He will stay and do his work faithfully as long as he can, and we won't ask for him back a minute sooner than he can be spared. Now, come and hear the letter. They all drew to the fire, Mother in the big chair with Beth at her feet, Meg and Amy perched on either arm of the chair, and Joe leaning on the back where no one would see any sign of emotion if the letters should happen to be touching. Very few letters were written in those hard times that were not touching, especially those which fathers sent home. In this one, little was said of the hardships endured, the dangers faced, or the homesickness conquered. It was a cheerful, hopeful letter, full of lively descriptions of camp life, marches, and military news, and only at the end did the writer's heart overflow with fatherly love and longing for his little girls at home. Give them all my dear love and a kiss. Tell them I think of them by day, pray for them by night, and find my best comfort in their affection at all times. A year seems very long to wait before I see them, but remind them that while we wait, we may all work so that these hard days need not be wasted. I know they will remember all I said to them, that they will be loving children to you, will do their duty faithfully, fight their bosom enemies bravely, and conquer themselves so beautifully that when I come back to them, I may be fonder and prouder than ever of my little women. Next door to the March home, there's a large house, and the girls are intrigued by the people who live there. An old, stern-seeming gentleman called Mr. Lawrence, and his grandson, a boy who seems to lead a quiet and lonely life. They're anxious to find out more about these neighbors, and at New Year, the chance comes. Such fun! Only see! A regular note of invitation from Mrs. Gardiner for tomorrow night, cried Meg, waving the precious paper and then proceeding to read it. Mrs. Gardiner would be happy to see Miss March and Miss Josephine at a little party on New Year's Eve. Marmy is willing we should go. Now, what shall we wear? What's the use of asking that when you know we shall wear our poplins because we haven't got anything else, answered Joe. If only I had a silk, sighed Meg. Mother says I may when I'm 18, perhaps, but two years is an everlasting time to wait. Well... I'm sure our pops will look like silk, and they are nice enough for us. Yours is as good as new, but I forgot the burn and the tear in mine. Oh, Meg, whatever shall I do? The burn shows badly. Well, you must sit still all you can and keep your back out of sight. The front is all right. I shall have a new ribbon for my hair, and Marmy will lend me her little pearl pin, and my new slippers are lovely, and my gloves will do, though they aren't as nice as I'd like. Mine are spoilt with lemonade, and I can't get any new ones, so I shall have to go without, said Joe, who never troubled herself much about dress. Well, you must have gloves, or I won't go, cried Meg decidedly. Gloves are more important than anything else. I shall be mortified if you didn't have them. Then I'll stay where I am. You can't ask Mother for new ones, Joe. They are so expensive, and you are so careless. She said when you spoilt the others that she shouldn't get you any more this winter. Can't you make them do? I can hold them crumpled up in my hand so no one will know how stained they are. That's all I can do. No, I'll tell you how we can manage. Each wear one good one and carry a bad one, don't you see? Your hands are bigger than mine, Joe, and you will stretch my glove dreadfully, began Meg, whose gloves were a tender point with her. Then I'll go without. I don't care what people say, cried Joe, taking up her book. You may have it, you may, only don't stain it and do behave nicely. Don't put your hands behind you or stare or say Christopher Columbus, will you? Don't worry about me, I'll be as prim as I can and not get into any scrape if I can help. Now go and answer your note and let me finish this splendid story. my sash right, and does my hair look very bad, said Meg, as she turned from the glass in Mrs. Gardner's dressing room. If you see me doing anything wrong, just remind me by a wink, will you, returned Joe, giving her collar a twitch and her hair a hasty brush. 
No, winking isn't ladylike. I'll lift my eyebrows if anything is wrong and nod if you are all right. Now hold your shoulders straight, Joe, and take short steps and don't shake hands if you are introduced to anyone. It isn't the thing. How do you learn all the proper ways, Meg? I never can. Isn't that music gay? Down they went, feeling a trifle timid, for they seldom went to parties, and informal as this little gathering was, it was an event to them. Mrs. Gardner greeted them kindly and handed them over to the eldest of her six daughters. Meg knew Sally and was at her ease very soon, but Joe, who didn't care much for girls or girlish gossip, stood about with her back carefully against the wall and felt as much out of place as a colt in a flower garden. Half a dozen jovial lads were talking about skates in another part of the room, and she longed to go and join them, for skating was one of the joys of her life. She telegraphed to Meg, but the eyebrows went up so alarmingly that she dared not stir. She could not roam about and amuse herself, for the burn in her poplin would show, so she stared at people rather forlornly till the dancing began. Meg was asked to dance at once. Her high-heeled slippers were very tight, but they tripped about so briskly that none would have guessed the pain their wearers suffered smilingly. Joe saw a big red-headed youth approaching her corner, and fearing he meant to engage her, she slipped into a curtained recess, intending to peep and enjoy herself in peace. Unfortunately, another bashful person had chosen the same refuge, for as the curtain fell behind her, she found herself face to face with the Lawrence boy. Dear me, I didn't know anyone was here, stammered Joe, preparing to back out as speedily as she had bounced in. But the boy laughed and said pleasantly, though he looked a little startled, Don't mind me, stay if you like. Shan't I disturb you? Not a bit, I only came here because I don't know many people and I felt rather strange at first, you know. So did I. Don't go away, please, unless you'd rather. The boy sat down again and looked at his pump till Joe said, trying to be polite and easy. I think I've had the pleasure of seeing you before. You live near us, don't you? Next door, and he looked up and laughed outright, for Joe's prim manner was rather funny. How is your cat, Miss March, asked the boy, trying to look sober. Nicely, thank you, Mr. Lawrence, but I am not Miss March. I'm only Joe. I'm not Mr. Lawrence. I'm only Laurie. Laurie Lawrence. <laughs> what an odd name. My first name is Theodore, but I don't like it. For the fellows called me Dora, so I made them say Laurie instead. I hate my name, too. So sentimental. I wish everyone would say Joe instead of Josephine. How did you make the boy stop calling you Dora? I thrashed him. I can't thrash Aunt March, so I suppose I shall have to bear it. And Joe resigned herself with a sigh. Do you like parties, she asked in a moment. Sometimes. You see, I've been abroad a good many years and haven't been in company enough yet to know how you do things here. Abroad, cried Joe. Oh, tell me about it. I love dearly to hear people describe their travels. Laurie didn't seem to know where to begin, but Joe's eager questions soon set him going, and he told her how he had been at school in Bavy, where the boys never wore hats and had a fleet of boats on the lake and for holiday fun went on walking trips about Switzerland with their teachers. Both peeped and criticized and chatted till they felt like old acquaintances. Laurie's bashfulness soon wore off, for Joe's gentlemanly demeanor amused and set him at his ease, and Joe was her merry self again, because her dress was forgotten and nobody lifted their eyebrows at her. She liked the Lawrence boy better than ever and took several good looks at him so that she might describe him to the girls, for they had no brothers, very few male cousins, and boys were almost unknown creatures to them. Curly black hair, brown skin, big black eyes, handsome nose, fine teeth, small hands and feet, taller than I am, very polite for a boy, and altogether jolly. Wonder how old he is. It was on the tip of Joe's tongue to ask, but she checked herself just in time, and with unusual tact, tried to find out in a roundabout way. I suppose you are going to college soon. I see you pegging away at your books. Uh, no, I mean studying hard. Laurie smiled and answered with a shrug. Not for a year or two. I won't go before 17 anyway. 
Aren't you but 15? asked Joe. 16, next month. How I wish I was going to college. You don't look as if you're going to like it. I'm going to hate it. Nothing but grinding or skylarking. And I don't like the way fellows do either in this country. What do you like? To live in Italy and to enjoy myself in my own way. Joe wanted very much to ask what his own way was, but his black brows looked rather threatening as he knit them, so she changed the subject by saying, as her foot kept time, that's a splendid piano in the next room. Why don't you go and try it? If you will come too, he answered with a gallant little bow. I can't, I can't, uh, for I told Meg I wouldn't because... Um, there Joe stopped and looked undecided whether to tell or to laugh. Because what, asked Laurie, curiously. You won't tell? Never. Well, I have a bad trick of standing before the fire, and so I burn my frock. And I scorched this one, and though it's nicely mended, it shows, and Meg told me to keep still so no one would see it. But Laurie didn't laugh. He only looked down a minute, and the expression of his face puzzled Joe when he said very gently, Never mind that. Please come. When the music stopped, they sat down, and Laurie was in the midst of an account of a student festival in Heidelberg when Meg appeared in search of her sister. She beckoned, and Joe reluctantly followed her into a little side room, where she suddenly found her on a sofa holding her foot and looking quite pale. I've sprained my ankle. That stupid high heel turned and gave me a sad wrench. It aches so I can hardly stand, and I don't know how I'm ever going to get home, she said, rocking to and fro in pain. I knew you'd hurt your feet with those silly shoes. I'm sorry, but I don't see what you can do except get a carriage or, or stay here all night, answered Joe, softly rubbing the poor ankle as she spoke. I can't have a carriage without it costing ever so much. I dare say I can't get one at all, for most people come in their own, and it's a long way to the stable and no one to send. I'll go. No, indeed, it's past nine and dark as Egypt. I can't stop here, for the house is full. Sally has some girls staying with her. I'll <sighs> just have to rest till Hannah comes to fetch us and then do the best I can. I'll ask Laurie. He will go, said Joe, looking relieved as the idea occurred to her. Mercy, no. Don't ask or tell anyone. Get my rubbers, Joe, and put these slippers with our things. As soon as supper is over, watch for Hannah and tell me the minute she comes to fetch us. They're going out to supper now. I'll stay with you. I'd rather... No, dear, run along and bring me some coffee. I'm so tired, I can't stir. So Meg reclined with rubbers well hidden, and Joe went blundering away to the dining room, which she found after going into a china closet and opening the door of a room where old Mr. Gardner was taking a little private refreshment. Making a dart at the table, she secured the coffee, which was immediately spilt, making the front of her dress as bad as the back. Oh, dear, what a blunderbuss I am, exclaimed Joe, finishing Meg's glove by scrubbing her gown with it. Can I help you, said a friendly voice, and there was Laurie, with a full cup in one hand and a plate of ice in the other. I was trying to get something from Meg, who was very, who was very tired, and, and someone shook me, and here I am in a nice state, answered Joe, glancing dismally from the stained skirt to the coffee-colored glove. Too bad I was looking for someone to give this to. May I take it to your sister? Oh, thank you. Um, I'll, uh, I'll show you where she is. I don't offer to take it myself, for I should only get into another scrape if I did. Joe led the way, and as if used to waiting on ladies, Laurie drew up a little table, brought a second installment of coffee and ice for Joe, and was so obliging that even particular Meg pronounced him a nice boy. They had a merry time over the bonbons and mottos with two or three other young people who had strayed in when Hannah appeared. Meg forgot her foot and rose so quickly that she was forced to catch hold of Joe with an exclamation of pain. Hush, don't say anything, she whispered. 
adding aloud, uh, it's nothing. I turned my foot a little, that's all, and limped upstairs to put her things on. Hannah scolded, Meg cried, and Joe was at her wit's end till she decided to take things into her own hands. Slipping out, she ran down and, finding a servant, asked if he could get her a carriage. It happened to be a hired waiter who knew nothing about the neighborhood, and Joe was looking round for help when Laurie, who had heard what she said, came up and offered his grandfather's carriage, which had just come for him. It's so early, you can't mean to go yet, began Joe, looking relieved but hesitating to accept the offer. I always go early. I do, truly. Please let me take you home. It's all on my way, you know, and it's raining, they say. That settled it. And telling him of Meg's mishap, Joe gratefully accepted and rushed up to bring down the rest of the party. Hannah hated rain as much as a cat does, so she made no trouble, and they rolled away in the luxurious closed carriage, feeling very festive and elegant. Laurie went on the box so Meg could keep her feet up, and the girls talked over their party in freedom. The girls quickly make friends with Laurie and then with his grandfather. Mr. Lawrence is not so stern as he'd seemed, and he grows very fond of his neighbors, especially of little Beth, whom he invites to come into his house and play the piano any time she likes. Girls, where are you going? asked Amy, coming into their room one Saturday afternoon and finding them getting ready to go out with an air of secrecy. Never mind, little girls shouldn't ask questions, returned Joe sharply. Now, if there's anything mortifying to our feelings when we are young, it is to be told back. Amy bridled up at this insult and determined to find out the secret if she teased for an hour. Turning to Meg, who never refused her anything very long, she said coaxingly, Do tell me, I should think you might let me go too, for Beth is fussing over her piano and I haven't got anything to do and I am so lonely. I can't, dear, because you aren't invited, began Meg. But Joe broke in impatiently. Now, Meg, be quiet or you will spoil it all. You can't go, Amy, so don't be a baby and whine about it. You are going somewhere with Lori. I know you are. Yes, we are. Now do be still and stop bothering. Amy held her tongue but used her eyes and saw Meg slip a fan into her pocket. I know, I know, you're going to the hall to see the play, The Seven Castles, she cried. And I shall go, for Mother said I might see it, and I've got my rag money, and it was mean not to tell me in time. Just listen to me a minute, Amy, and be a good child, said Meg, soothingly. Mother doesn't wish you to go this week because of your cold. Your eyes are not well enough yet to bear the light. Next week you can go with Beth and Hannah and have a nice time. I don't like that half as well as going with you and Laurie. Please let me go. I've been sick with this cold for so long and, and, and shut up. I'm dying for some fun. Oh, do, Meg, do, Meg. I'll be ever so good, pleaded Amy, looking as pathetic as she could. Suppose we take her. I don't believe Mother would mind if we bundle her up well, began Meg. If she goes, I shan't, said Joe. And if I don't, Laurie won't like it. And it will be very rude after he invited only us to go and drag Amy. I should think she'd hate to poke herself where she isn't wanted. Tone and manner angered Amy, who began to put her boots on, saying in her most aggravating way, I shall go. Meg says I may, and if I pay for myself, Lori has anything to do with it. You can't sit with us, for our seats are reserved, Joe replied, and you mustn't sit alone, so Lori will give you his place, and that will spoil our pleasure, or he'll get another seat for you, and that isn't proper when you weren't asked. You shan't stir a step, so you may just as well stay where you are. Sitting on the floor with one boot on, Amy began to cry and Meg to reason with her when Laurie called from below and the two girls hurried down, leaving their sister wailing. Just as the party were setting out, Amy called over the banisters in a threatening voice. You'll be sorry for this, Joe March. See if you ain't. Fiddlesticks, returned Joe, slamming the door. <laughs> When they got home, they found Amy reading in the parlor. She assumed an injured air as they came in, never lifted her eyes from her book or asked a single question. Perhaps curiosity might have conquered resentment if Beth had not been there to inquire and receive a glowing description of the play. 
On going up to put away her best hat, Joe's first look was towards the bureau, for in their last quarrel, Amy had soothed her feelings by turning Joe's top drawer upside down on the floor. Everything was in its place, however, and after a hasty glance into her various closets, bags, and boxes, Joe decided that Amy had forgiven and forgotten her wrongs. There, Joe was mistaken, for next day she made a discovery which produced a tempest. Meg, Beth, and Amy were sitting together late in the afternoon when Joe burst into the room. Has anyone taken my book? Meg and Beth said no at once. Amy poked the fire and said nothing. Joe saw her color rise and was down upon her in a minute. Amy, you've got it. No, I haven't. You know where it is then? No, I don't. That's a fib, cried Joe, taking her by the shoulders and looking fierce enough to frighten a much braver child than Amy. It isn't. I haven't got it, and I don't know where it is now, and I don't care. You know something about it, Amy, and you'd better tell it once, or I'll make you. And Joe gave her a slight shake. Scold as much as you like. You'll never see your silly old book again. Why not? I burn it up. My little book I was so fond of and worked over and meant to finish before Father got home. Have you really burnt it, Amy, said Joe, turning very pale. Yes, I did. I told you I'd make you pay for being so cross yesterday, and I have, so I... Amy got no further, for Joe's hot temper mastered her, and she shook Amy till her teeth chattered in her head, crying in a passion of grief and anger. You... Wicked, wicked girl! I never can write it again, and I'll never forgive you as long as I live! Meg flew to rescue Amy and Beth to pacify Joe, but Joe was quite beside herself, and with a parting box on her sister's ear, she rushed out of the room. The storm cleared below, for Mrs. March came home and having heard the story soon brought Amy to a sense of the wrong she had done her sister. Joe's book was the pride of her heart. It was only half a dozen little fairy tales, but Joe had worked over them patiently, putting her whole heart into her work, hoping to make something good enough to print. She had just copied them with great care and had destroyed the old manuscript so that Amy's bonfire had consumed the loving work of several years. Mrs. March looked grave and grieved, and Amy felt that no one would love her till she had asked pardon for the act which she now regretted more than any of them. When the tea bell rang, Joe appeared, looking so grim and unapproachable that it took all Amy's courage to say meekly, Please forgive me, Joe. I'm very, very sorry. I shall never forgive you, was Joe's stern answer, and from that moment she ignored Amy entirely. No one spoke of the great trouble, not even Mrs. March, for all had learned by experience that when Joe was in that mood, words were wasted, and the wisest course was to wait till some little accident or her own generous nature softened Joe's resentment and healed the breach. It was not a happy evening, for though they sewed as usual while their mother read aloud, something was wanting, and the sweet home peace was disturbed. As Joe received her goodnight kiss, Mrs. March whispered gently, Joe, don't let the sun go down upon your anger. Forgive each other, help each other, and begin again tomorrow. Joe wanted to lay her head down on that motherly bosom and cry her grief and anger all away. But tears were an unmanly weakness, and she felt so deeply injured that she really couldn't quite forgive yet. So she winked hard, shook her head, and said gruffly, because Amy was listening, It was an abominable thing to do, and she don't deserve to be forgiven. Amy was much offended that her overtures of peace had been repulsed, and began to wish she had not humbled herself. Joe still looked like a thundercloud, and nothing went well all day. Meg was pensive. Beth would look grieved and wistful, 
and Amy kept making remarks about people who were always talking about being good and yet wouldn't try when other people set them a virtuous example. Everybody is so hateful, Joe said to herself. I'll ask Laurie to go skating. He is always kind and jolly and will put me to rights, I know. Amy heard the clash of skates and looked out with an impatient exclamation. There, she promised I should go out next time, for this is the last ice we shall have, but it's no use to ask such a cross patch to take me. Don't say that. You were very naughty, and it is hard to forgive the loss of her precious little book, said Meg. But I think she might do it now if you try her at the right minute. Go after them, Amy. Don't say anything till Dro has got good-natured with Lori. Then take a quiet minute and just, just kiss her or do some kind thing, and I'm sure she'll be friends again with all her heart. I'll try, said Amy, for the advice suited her and she ran after the friends who were just disappearing over the hill. It was not far to the river, but both were ready before Amy reached them. Joe saw her coming and turned her back. Laurie did not see, for he was carefully skating along the shore, sounding the ice, for a warm spell had preceded the cold snap. I'll go on to the first bend and see if it's all right before we begin to race, Amy heard him say as he shot away, looking like a young Russian in his fur-trimmed coat and cap. Joe heard Amy panting after her, stamping her feet and blowing on her fingers as she tried to put her skates on. But Joe never turned and went slowly zigzagging down the river, taking a bitter, unhappy sort of satisfaction in her sister's trouble. As Laurie turned the bend, he shouted back, Keep near the shore! It isn't safe in the middle! Joe heard, but Amy was just struggling to her feet and did not catch a word. Joe glanced over her shoulder and the little demon she was harboring said in her ear, no matter whether she heard or not, let her take care of herself. Laurie had vanished round the bend. Joe was just at the turn, and Amy far behind, striking out towards the smoother ice in the middle of the river. For a minute, Joe stood still with a strange feeling at her heart. Then she resolved to go on, but something held and turned her round just in time to see Amy throw up her hands and go down with a sudden crash of rotten ice, a splash of water, and a cry that made Joe's heart stand still with fear. She tried to call Lori, but her voice was gone. She tried to rush forward, but her feet seemed to have no strength in them, and for a second she could only stand motionless, staring with a terror-stricken face at the little blue hood above the black water. Something rushed swiftly by her, and Lori's voice cried out, Bring a rail, quick! Quick! How she did it, she never knew. But for the next few minutes, she worked as if possessed, blindly obeying Laurie, who was quite self-possessed, and lying flat, held Amy up by his arm till Joe dragged a rail from the fence, and together they got the child out, more frightened than hurt. Shivering, dripping, and crying, they got Amy home. And after an exciting time of it, she fell asleep, rolled in blankets before a hot fire. During the bustle, Joe had scarcely spoken, but flown about looking pale and wild with her things half off, her dress torn, and her hands cut and bruised by ice and rails and refractory buckles. When Amy was comfortably asleep, the house quiet, and Mrs. March sitting by the bed, she called Joe to her and began to bind up the hurt hand. Are you sure she is safe, Mother? whispered Joe. Quite safe, dear. She is not hurt and won't even take cold. I think you were so sensible in covering her and getting her home quickly. Laurie did it all. Oh, Mother, if she should die, it would be my fault. And Joe dropped down beside the bed in a passion of penitent tears, telling all that had happened, bitterly condemning her hardness of heart. It's my dreadful temper. I try to cure it. I think I have. And then it breaks up worse than ever. Oh, Mother, what should I do? What should I do? cried Joe in despair. Watch and pray, dear. Never get tired of trying and never think it is impossible to conquer your fault, said Mrs. March, drawing Joe's head to her shoulder and kissing the wet cheek tenderly. Joe's only answer was to hold her mother close, and in the silence which followed, the sincerest prayer she had ever prayed left her heart without words. Amy stirred and sighed in her sleep. And, as if eager to begin at once to mend her fault, Joe looked up with an expression on her face which it had never worn before. 
I let the sun go down on my anger. I wouldn't forgive her. And today, if it hadn't been for Lori, it might have been too late. How could I be so wicked, said Joe, half aloud as she leaned over her sister, softly stroking the wet hair scattered on the pillow. As if she heard, Amy opened her eyes and held out her arms with a smile that went straight to Joe's heart. Neither said a word, but they hugged one another close in spite of the blankets, and everything was forgiven and forgotten in one hearty kiss. November is the most disagreeable month in the whole year, said Meg, standing at the window one dull afternoon, looking out at the frost-bitten garden. If something very pleasant should happen now, we should think it a delightful month, said Beth, who took a hopeful view of everything, even November. I dare say, but nothing pleasant ever does happen in this family, said Meg, who was out of sorts. We go grubbing along day after day without a bit of change and very little fun. We might as well be on a treadmill. My patience, how blue we are, cried Joe. I don't much wonder, poor darling, for you see other girls having splendid times while you grind, grind, year in and year out. Oh, don't I wish I could manage things for you as I do for my heroines. You're pretty enough and good enough already, so I'd have some rich relation leave you a fortune unexpectedly. Then you dash out as an heiress, scorn everyone who has slighted you, Go abroad and come home, my lady something, in a blaze of splendor and elegance. People don't have fortunes left them in that style nowadays, said Meg. Men have to work and women to marry for money. It's a dreadful, unjust world. Joe and I are going to make fortunes for you all. Just wait ten years and see if we don't, said Amy, who sat in a corner making mud pies, as Hannah called her little clay models of birds. Beth, who sat at the other window, said, smiling, Two pleasant things are going to happen right away. Marmy is coming down the street, and Laurie is tramping through the garden as if he had something nice to tell. In they both came, Mrs. March with her usual question, Any letter from Father Girls? And Laurie to say in his persuasive way, Won't some of you come for a drive? I've been working away at mathematics till my head is in a muddle, and I'm going to freshen my wits by a brisk turn. Come, Joe, you and Beth will go, won't you? Of of course you will. Can I do anything for you, Madam Mother? asked Laurie, leaning over Mrs. March's chair. No, thank you. Except call at the office if you'll be so kind, dear. It's our day for a letter and the postman hasn't been. Father is as regular as the sun, but there's some delay on the way, perhaps. A sharp ring interrupted her, and a minute after, Hannah came in with a letter. It's one of them horrid telegraph things, Mum, she said, handing it as if she was afraid it would explode and do some damage. At the word telegraph, Mrs. March snatched it, read the two lines it contained, and dropped back into her chair as white as if the little paper had sent a bullet to her heart. Lori dashed downstairs for water while Meg and Hannah supported her, and Joe read aloud in a frightened voice. Mrs. March, your husband is very ill. Come at once. S. Hale, Blank Hospital, Washington. How still the room was as they listened breathlessly. How strangely the day darkened outside. And how suddenly the whole world seemed to change as the girls gathered about their mother, feeling as if all the happiness and support of their lives was about to be taken from them. Mrs. March was herself again directly, read the message over, and stretched out her arms to her daughters, saying in a tone they never forgot, I shall go at once, but it may be too late. Oh, children, children, help me to bear it.
Hannah was the first to recover, and with unconscious wisdom, she set all the rest a good example, for with her, work was the panacea for most afflictions. The Lord keep the dear man. I won't waste no time a crying, but get your things ready right away, Mum. she said heartily as she wiped her face on her apron and went away to work like three women in one. She's right, there's no time for tears now. Be calm, girls, and let me think. They tried to be calm, poor things, as their mother sat up, looking pale but steady, and put away her grief to think and plan for them. Where's Laurie? she asked presently, when she had collected her thoughts and decided on the first duties to be done. Here, ma'am, oh, please let me do something, cried the boy, hurrying from the next room. Send a telegram saying I will come at once. The next train goes early in the morning. I'll take that. What else? The horses are ready. I can go anywhere, do anything, he said, looking ready to fly to the end of the earth. Leave a note at Aunt March's. Joe, give me that pen and paper. Tearing off the blank side of one of her newly copied pages, Joe drew the table before her mother, well knowing that money for the long, sad journey must be borrowed, and feeling as if she could do anything to add a little to the sum for her father. Now go, dear, but don't kill yourself driving at a desperate pace. There is no need of that. Mrs. March's warning was evidently thrown away, for five minutes later, Laurie tore by the window on his own fleet horse, riding as if for his life. Joe, run now. Run and get these things. I'll put them down. They'll be needed, and I must go prepared for nursing. Hospital stores are not always good. Beth, go and ask Mr. Lawrence for a couple of bottles of old wine. I'm not too proud to beg for Father. He shall have the best of everything. Amy, tell Hannah to get down the black trunk. And Meg, come and help me find my things, for I'm half bewildered. Writing, thinking, and directing all at once might well bewilder the poor lady, and Meg begged her to sit down quietly in her room for a little while and let them work. Everyone scattered like leaves before a gust of wind, and the quiet, happy household was broken up as suddenly as if the paper had been an evil spell. Mr. Lawrence came hurrying back with Beth, bringing every comfort the kind old gentleman could think of for the invalid and friendliest promises of protection for the girls during the mother's absence, which comforted her very much. There was nothing he didn't offer, from his own dressing gown to himself as escort. But that last was impossible. Mrs. March would not hear of the old gentleman's undertaking the long journey. Yet an expression of relief was visible when he spoke of it, for anxiety ill fits one for traveling. He saw the look, knit his heavy eyebrows, rubbed his hands, and marched abruptly away, saying he'd be back directly. No one had time to think of him again, until, as Meg ran through the entry with a pair of rubbers in one hand and a cup of tea in the other, she came suddenly upon Mr. Brook, Laurie's young tutor, who was a good friend. I'm very sorry to hear of this, Miss March, he said, in the kind, quiet tone which sounded pleasantly to her perturbed spirit. I came to offer myself as escort to your mother. Mr. Lawrence has commissions for me in Washington, and it will give me real satisfaction to be of service to her there. Down dropped the rubbers, and the tea was very near following, as Meg put out her hand with a face so full of gratitude that Mr. Brooke would have felt repaid for a much greater sacrifice than the trifling one of time and comfort which he was about to make. How kind you all are. Mother will accept, I'm sure, and it will be such a relief to know that she has someone to take care of her. Thank you very much very much. Meg spoke earnestly and forgot herself entirely till something in the brown eyes looking down at her made her remember the cooling tea and led the way into the parlor saying she would call her mother. Everything was arranged by the time Laurie returned with a note from Aunt March enclosing the desired sum and a few lines repeating what she had often said before, that she had always told them it was absurd for March to go into the army always predicted that no good would come of it, and she hoped they would take her advice next time. Mrs. March put the note in the fire, the money in her purse, and went on with her preparations. The short afternoon wore away. All the other errands were done, and Meg and her mother busy at some necessary needlework while Beth and Amy got tea, and Hannah finished her ironing with what she called a slap and a bang. But still, Joe did not come. They began to get anxious, and Laurie went off to find her, for one never knew what freak Joe might take into her head. He missed her, however, and she came walking in with a very queer expression of countenance, for there was a mixture of fun and fear, satisfaction and regret in it, 
which puzzled the family as much as did the roll of bills she laid before her mother, saying with a little choke in her voice, that's my contribution towards making father comfortable and bringing him home. Well, gee, but Joe, where did you get it? $25? Oh, Joe, I hope you haven't done anything rash. No, it's mine, honestly. I didn't beg, borrow, or steal it. I earned it, and I don't think you'll blame me, for I only sold what was my own. As she spoke, Joe took off her bonnet, and a general outcry arose for all her abundant hair was cut short. <gasps> your hair! Joe, your beautiful hair! Oh, Joe, how could you? Your one beauty! Oh, my dear girl, there was no need of this. You don't look like my Joe anymore. But I love you dearly for it. Beth hugged the cropped head tenderly. Joe assumed an indifferent air, which did not deceive anyone a particle and said, rumpling up the brown bush and trying to look as if she liked it. It doesn't affect the fate of the nation, so don't wail, Beth. It will be good for my vanity. I was getting too proud of my wig. It will do my brains good to have that mop taken off. My head feels deliciously light and cool, and the barber said I soon could have a curly crop, which will be boyish, becoming, and easy to keep in order. I'm satisfied, so please take the money and let's have supper. In the cold gray dawn, the sisters lit their lamp, and as they dressed, agreed to say goodbye cheerfully and hopefully and send their mother on her anxious journey, unsaddened by tears or complaints from them. Everything seemed very strange when they went down, so dim and still outside, and so full of light and bustle within. Breakfast at that early hour seemed odd, and even Hannah's familiar face looked unnatural as she flew about her kitchen with her nightcap on. The big trunk stood ready in the hall. Mother's cloak and bonnet lay on the sofa, and Mother herself sat trying to eat, but looking so pale and worn with sleeplessness and anxiety that the girls found it very hard to keep their resolution. Nobody talked much, but as the time drew very near and they sat waiting for the carriage, Mrs. March said to the girls, who were all busied about her, Children, I leave you to Hannah's care and Mr. Lawrence's protection. Hannah is faithfulness itself, and our good neighbor will guard you as if you were his own. I have no fears for you, yet I am anxious that you should take this trouble rightly. Don't grieve and fret when I am gone, or think that you can comfort yourselves by being idle and trying to forget. Go on with your work as usual, for work is a blessed solace. Hope and keep busy, and whatever happens, remember that you never can be fatherless. Yes, Mother. The rattle of an approaching carriage made them all start and listen. That was the hard minute, but the girls stood it well. No one cried. No one ran away or uttered a lamentation, though their hearts were very heavy as they sent loving messages to Father, remembering as they spoke that it might be too late to deliver them. They kissed their mother quietly, clung about her tenderly, and tried to wave their hands cheerfully when she drove away. Laurie and his grandfather came over to see her off, and Mr. Brooke looked so strong and sensible and kind that the girls christened him Mr. Greatheart on the spot. Goodbye, my darlings. God bless and keep us all, whispered Mrs. March as she kissed one dear little face after the other and hurried into the carriage. With Hannah's help, they manage the house, they write constantly to their parents, and are cheered by the news that their father is gradually getting better. But then little Beth catches scarlet fever from a baby she's been nursing. At one time, it seems she is dying, and Mrs. March is summoned home. Then, after one terrible night, Beth, too, begins to recover. Like sunshine after storm were the peaceful weeks which followed, the invalids improved rapidly 
and Mr. March began to talk of returning early in the new year. Beth was soon able to lie on the study sofa all day, amusing herself with the well-beloved cats at first, and in time with doll sewing, which had fallen sadly behind. Her once active limbs were so stiff and feeble that Joe took her a daily airing about the house in her strong arms. As Christmas approached, the usual mysteries began to haunt the house, and Joe frequently convulsed the family by proposing utterly impossible or magnificently absurd ceremonies in honor of this unusually merry Christmas. Laurie was equally impractical and would have had bonfires, skyrockets, and triumphal arches if he had had his own way. After many skirmishes and snubbings, the ambitious pair were considered effectually quenched and went about with forlorn faces, which were rather belied by explosions of laughter when the two got together. Several days of unusually mild weather ushered in a splendid Christmas day. To begin with, Mr. March wrote that he should soon be with them. Then Beth felt uncommonly well that morning, and, being dressed in her mother's gift, a soft crimson wrapper, was borne in triumph to the window to behold the offering of Joe and Lori. Like elves, they had worked by night and conjured up a comical surprise. Out in the garden stood a stately snow maiden, crowned with holly, bearing a basket of fruit and flowers in one hand, a great roll of music in the other, a perfect rainbow of an afghan round her chilly shoulders, and a Christmas carol issuing from her lips on a pink paper streamer. How Beth laughed when she saw it. How Laurie ran up and down to bring in the gift, and what ridiculous speeches Joe made as she presented them. I'm so full of happiness that if Father was only here, I couldn't hold one drop more, said Beth, as Joe carried her off to the study to rest after the excitement. So am I, added Joe, slapping the pocket wherein reposed the long-desired Undine and Sintram. I'm sure I am, echoed Amy, poring over the engraved copy of the Madonna and Child, which her mother had given her in a pretty frame. Of course I am, cried Meg, smoothing the silvery folds of her first silk dress a present from Mr. Lawrence. How can I be otherwise, said Mrs. March gratefully, as her eyes went from her husband's letter to Beth's smiling face, and her hand caressed the brooch made of gray and golden chestnut and dark brown hair, which the girls had just fastened on her breast. Now and then, in this workaday world, things do happen in the delightful storybook fashion, and what a comfort that is. Half an hour after everyone had said they were so happy, they could only hold one drop more. The drop came. Lori opened the parlor door and popped his head in very quietly. He might just as well have turned a somersault and uttered an Indian war whoop, for his face was so full of suppressed excitement that everyone jumped up, though he only said in a queer, breathless voice, Here's another Christmas present for the March family. Before the words were well out of his mouth, he was whisked away somehow, and in his place appeared a tall man, muffled up to his eyes, leaning on the arm of another tall man who tried to say something but couldn't. Of course, there was a general stampede, and for several minutes everybody seemed to lose their wits, for the strangest things were done, and no one said a word. Mr. March became invisible in the embrace of four pairs of loving arms, Joe disgraced herself by nearly fainting away and had to be doctored by Laurie in the china closet. Mr. Brooke kissed Meg entirely by mistake, as he somewhat incoherently explained, and Amy, the dignified, tumbled over a stool and never stopping to get up, hugged and cried over her father's boots in the most touching manner. Mrs. March was the first to recover herself and held up her hand with a warning. Hush, remember Beth. But it was too late. The study door flew open. The little red wrapper appeared on the threshold. Joy put strength into the feeble limbs, and Beth ran straight into her father's arms. Never mind what happened just after that, for the full hearts overflowed, washing away the bitterness of the past and leaving only the sweetness of the present. For Joe, there's still one cause for concern. Everyone knows by now that Mr. John Brooke, Laurie's tutor, has fallen in love with Meg. And Joe is afraid that Meg will accept him and leave the family. Mother and daughters hovered about Mr. March the next day, neglecting everything to look at, 
wait upon and listen to the new invalid, who was in a fair way to be killed by kindness. As he sat propped up in a big chair by Beth's sofa, with the other three close by, nothing seemed needed to complete their happiness. But something was needed, and the elder ones felt it, though none confessed the fact. Mr. and Mrs. March looked at one another with an anxious expression as their eyes followed Meg. Joe had sudden fits of sobriety and was seen to shake her fist at Mr. Brooke's umbrella, which had been left in the hall. Meg was absent-minded, shy, and silent, started when the bell rang, and colored when John's name was mentioned. Laurie went by in the afternoon, and seeing Meg at the window seemed suddenly possessed with a melodramatic fit, for he fell down upon one knee in the snow, beat his breast, tore his hair, and clasped his hands imploringly, as if begging some boon, and when Meg told him to behave himself and go away, he wrung imaginary tears out of his handkerchief and staggered round the corner as if in utter despair. What does that goose mean, said Meg, laughing and trying to look unconscious. He's showing you how your John will go on by and by. Touching, isn't it, answered Joe scornfully. Don't say my John, it isn't proper or true. But Meg's voice lingered over the words as if they sounded pleasant to her. Please don't plague me, Joe. I've told you I don't care much about him, and there isn't to be anything said, but we are all to be friendly and go on as before. We can't, said Joe. You are not like your old self a bit and seem ever so far away from me. I don't mean to plague you and will bear it like a man, but I do wish it was all settled. I hate to wait, so if you mean ever to do it, make haste and have it over quickly. I can't say or do anything till he speaks, and he won't, began Meg bending over her work with a queer little smile. If he did speak, you wouldn't know what to say, but would cry or blush or let him have his own way instead of giving a good decided no. I'm not so silly and weak as you think, Joe. I know just what I should say, for I planned it all so I needn't be taken unawares. There's no knowing what may happen, and I wish to be prepared. Joe couldn't help smiling at the important air which Meg had unconsciously assumed. Would you mind telling me what you'd say, she asked. Oh, I should merely say quite calmly and decidedly, thank you, Mr. Brooke. You are very kind, but I agree with Father that I am too young to enter into any engagement at present. So please say no more, but let us be friends as we were. Hmm, that's stiff and cool enough. I don't believe you'll ever say it. And I know he won't be satisfied if you do. If he goes on like the rejected lovers in books, you'll give in rather than hurt his feelings. No, I won't. I shall tell him I've made up my mind and shall walk out of the room with dignity. Meg rose as she spoke and was just going to rehearse the dignified exit when a step in the hall made her fly into her seat and begin to sew as if her life depended on finishing that particular seam in a given time. Joe smothered a laugh at the sudden change and, when someone gave a modest tap, opened the door with a grim aspect which was anything but hospitable. Oh, uh, good afternoon. I came to get my umbrella. Uh, that is, I, uh, to, I, I came to see how your father finds himself today, said Mr. Brooke, getting a trifle confused as his eye went from one telltale face to the other. It's very well. He's in the rack. I'll get him and tell it you are here and having jumbled her father and the umbrella well together in her reply, Joe slipped out of the room to give Meg a chance to make her speech and air her dignity. But the instant she vanished, Meg began to sidle towards the door, murmuring, Mother will, will be happy to see you. Uh, pray sit down. I'll call her. Don't go. Are you afraid of me, Margaret? And Mr. Brooke looked so hurt that Meg thought she must have done something very rude. She blushed up to the little curls on her forehead, for he had never called her Margaret before, and she was surprised to find how natural and sweet it seemed to hear him say it. Anxious to appear friendly and at her ease, she put out her hand with a confiding gesture and said gratefully, How can I be afraid when you have been so kind to Father? I only wish I could thank you for it. Shall I tell you how? asked Mr. Brooke holding the small hand fast in both his own and looking down at Meg with so much love in the brown eyes 
that her heart began to flutter, and she both longed to run away and to stop and listen. Oh, no, please don't. I'd rather not, she said, trying to withdraw her hand and looking frightened in spite of her denial. I won't trouble you. I only want to know if you care for me a little, Meg. I love you so much. This was the moment for the calm, proper speech, but Meg didn't make it. She forgot every word of it, hung her head, and answered, I don't know. So softly that John had to stoop down to catch the foolish little reply. He seemed to think it was worth the trouble, for he smiled to himself as if quite satisfied pressed the plump hand gratefully and said in his most persuasive tone, Will you try and find out? I want to know so much, for I can't go to work with any heart until I learn whether I am to have my reward in the end or not. His tone was properly beseeching, but stealing a shy look at him, Meg saw that his eyes were merry as well as tender, and that he wore the satisfied smile of one who had no doubt success. This nettled her. The lover of power, which sleeps in the bosom of the best of little women, woke up all of a sudden and took possession of her. She felt excited and strained, and not knowing what to do, followed a capricious impulse, and withdrawing her hand, said petulantly, I don't choose. Please go away and let me be. Poor Mr. Brooke looked as if his lovely castle in the air was tumbling about his ears, for he had never seen Meg in such a mood before. Do you really mean that, he asked, following her as she walked away. Yes, I do. I don't want to be worried about such things. Father says I needn't. It's too soon, and I'd rather not. May I not hope you'll change your mind by and by? I'll wait and say nothing till you have had more time. Don't play with me, Meg. I didn't think that of you. Don't think of me at all. I'd rather you wouldn't, said Meg, taking a naughty satisfaction in trying her lover's patience and her own power. He was grave and silent now, and looked decidedly more like the novel heroes whom she admired. But he neither slapped his forehead nor tramped about the room as they did, he just stood looking at her wistfully, so tenderly, that she found her heart relenting in spite of her. What would have happened next, I cannot say, if Aunt March had not come hobbling in at this interesting minute. Aunt March couldn't resist her longing to see her nephew, for she had met Laurie as she took her airing, and hearing of Mr. March's arrival, drove straight out to see him. The family were all busy in the back part of the house, and she had made her way quietly in, hoping to surprise them. She did surprise two of them so much that Meg started as if she had seen a ghost, and Mr. Brooke vanished into the study. Bless me, what's all this, cried the old lady with a rap of her cane. It's father's friend. I'm so surprised to see you, stammered Meg, feeling that she was in for a lecture now. That's evident, returned Aunt March, sitting down. But what is father's friend saying to make you look like a peony? There's mischief going on, and I insist on knowing what it is. We were merely talking. Mr. Brooke came for his umbrella, began Meg, wishing that Mr. Brooke and his umbrella were safely out of the house. Brooke, that boy's tutor? Ah, I understand now. I know all about it. You haven't gone and accepted him, child, cried Aunt March, looking scandalized. Hush, he'll hear. Shan't I call mother, said Meg, much troubled. Not yet. I have something to say to you and must free my mind at once. Tell me, do you mean to marry this Mr. Cook? If you do, not one penny of my money ever goes to you. Remember that and be a sensible girl, said the old lady impressively. I shall marry whom I please, Aunt March, and you can leave your money to anyone you like. Hi ti 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 Is that the way you take my advice, miss? You'll be sorry for it by and by when you've tried love in a cottage and found it a failure. It can't be worse than some people find in big houses, retorted Meg. I couldn't do better if I waited half my life. John is good and wise. He's got heaps of talent. He's willing to work and sure to get on. He's so energetic and brave. Everyone likes and respects him, 
And I'm proud to think he cares for me, though I'm so poor and young and silly. He knows you have got rich relations, child. That's the secret of his liking, I suspect. Aunt March, how dare you say such a thing? My John wouldn't marry for money any more than I would. We are willing to work and we mean to wait. I'm not afraid of being poor, for I've been happy so far and I know I shall be with him because, because he loves me and I... Meg stopped there, remembering all of a sudden that she hadn't made up her mind, that she had told her John to go away and that he might be overhearing her inconsistent remarks. Aunt March was very angry, for she had set her heart on having her pretty niece make a fine match, and something in the girl's happy young face made the old woman feel both sad and sour. Well, I wash my hands of the whole affair. You are a willful child, and you've lost more than you know by this piece of folly. No, I won't stop. I'm disappointed in you and haven't spirits to see your father now. Don't expect anything from me when you are married. I've done with you forever. And slamming the door in Meg's face, Aunt March drove off in high dudgeon. She seemed to take all the girl's courage with her, for when left alone, Meg stood a moment, undecided whether to laugh or cry. Before she could make up her mind, she was taken possession of by Mr. Brooks, who said all in one breath, I couldn't help hearing, Meg. Thank you for defending me, for proving that you do care for me a little bit. I didn't know how much till she abused you, began Meg. And I needn't go away, but may stay and be happy, may I, dear? Here was another fine chance to make the crushing speech and the stately exit. But Meg never thought of doing either and disgraced herself forever in Joe's eyes by meekly whispering, Yes, John and hiding her face on Mr. Brooks' waistcoat. Fifteen minutes after Aunt March's departure, Joe came softly downstairs, paused an instant at the parlor door, and hearing no sound within, nodded and smiled with a satisfied expression, saying to herself, she has Send him away as we planned, and that affair is settled. I'll go and hear the fun and have a good laugh over it. But poor Joe never got her laugh, for she was transfixed upon the threshold by a spectacle which held her there, staring with her mouth nearly as wide open as her eyes. Going to exult over a fallen enemy and to praise a strong-minded sister for the banishment of an objectionable lover, it certainly was a shock to behold the aforesaid enemy serenely sitting on the sofa with the strong-minded sister enthroned upon his knee and wearing an expression of the most abject submission. Joe gave a sort of gasp, as if a cold shower bath had suddenly fallen upon her. At the odd sound, the lovers turned and saw her. Meg jumped up, looking both proud and shy. But that man, as Joe called him, actually laughed and said coolly as he kissed the astonished newcomer, Sister Joe, congratulate us. That was adding insult to injury. It was altogether too much. And making some wild demonstration with her hands, Joe vanished without a word. Rushing upstairs, she startled the invalid by exclaiming tragically as she burst into the room, Oh, do somebody go down quick. John Brooke is acting dreadfully, and Meg likes it. Mr. and Mrs. March left the room with speed, and casting herself upon the bed, Joe cried and scolded tempestuously as she told the awful news to Beth and Amy. The little girls, however, considered it a most agreeable and interesting event, and Joe got little comfort from them, so she went up to her refuge in the garret. Nobody ever knew what went on in the parlor that afternoon, but a great deal of talking was done, and quiet Mr. Brooke astonished his friends by the eloquence and spirit with which he pleaded his suit, told his plans, and persuaded them to arrange everything just as he wanted it. The tea bell rang before he had finished describing the paradise which he meant to earn for Meg, and he proudly took her in for supper, both looking so happy that Joe hadn't the heart to be jealous or dismal. No one ate much, but everyone looked very happy, and the old room seemed to brighten up amazingly when the first romance of the family began there. 
You can't say nothing pleasant ever happens now, can you, Meg? Said Amy, trying to decide how she would group the lovers in the sketch she was planning to make. No, I'm sure I can't. How much has happened since I said that? It seems a year ago, answered Meg, who was in a blissful dream lifted far above such common things as bread and butter. The joys come close upon the sorrows this time, and I rather think the changes have begun, said Mrs. March. In most families, there comes now and then a year full of events. This has been such a one, but it ends quite well after all. Hope the next one will end better, muttered Joe, who found it very hard to see Meg absorbed in a stranger before her face. For Joe loved a few persons very dearly and dreaded to have their affection lost or lessened in any way. I hope the third year from this will end better, I mean, it shall if I live to work out my plan, said Mr. Brooks, smiling at Meg, as if everything had become possible to him now. Doesn't it seem very long to wait, asked Amy, who was in a hurry for the wedding. I've got so much to learn before I shall be ready. It seems a short time to me, answered Meg, with a sweet gravity in her face, never seen there before. You have only to wait. I have to do the work, said John, beginning his labors by picking up Meg's napkin with an expression which caused Jo to shake her head and then say to herself with an air of relief as the front door banged, Here comes Laurie. Now we shall have a little sensible conversation. But Jo was mistaken, for Laurie came prancing in, overflowing with spirits, bearing a great bridal-looking bouquet from Mrs. John Brooks and evidently laboring under the delusion that the whole affair had been brought about by his excellent management. I knew Brooke would have it all his own way. He always does, for when he makes up his mind to accomplish anything, it's done, though the sky falls, said Laurie, when he had presented his offering and his congratulations. Much obliged for the recommendation. I take it as a good omen for the future, and invite you to my wedding on the spot, answered Mr. Brooke, who felt at peace with all mankind, even his mischievous pupil. I'll come if I'm at the ends of the earth, for the sight of Joe's face alone on that occasion would be worth a long journey. You don't look festive, ma'am. What's the matter? asked Laurie, following her into a corner of the parlor where they had all adjourned to greet Mr. Lawrence. I don't approve of the match, but I've made up my mind to bear it and shall not say a word against it, said Joe solemnly. You can't know how hard it is for me to give up, Meg, she continued with a little quaver in her voice. You don't give her up. You only go have, said Laurie, consolingly. It can never be the same again. I've lost my dearest friend, sighed Joe. You've got me anyhow. I'm not good for much, I know, but I'll stand by you, Joe, all the days of my life. Upon my word, I will. And Laurie meant what he said. I know you will, and I'm ever so much obliged. You are always a great comfort to me. Well, now, don't be dismal. There's a good fellow. It's all right, you see. Meg is happy. Brooke will fly round and get settled immediately. Grandpa will attend to him. And it will be very jolly to see Meg in her own little house. We'll have capital times after she is gone, for I shall be through college before long, and then we'll go abroad or some nice trip or other. Wouldn't that console you? I rather think it would. But there's no knowing what may happen in three years, said Joe. That's true. Don't you wish you could take a look forward and see where we shall all be then? I do, returned Laurie. I think not, for I might see something sad, and everyone looks so happy now. I don't believe they could be much improved, and Joe's eyes went slowly round the room, brightening as they looked, for the prospect was a pleasant one. Father and mother sat together, quietly reliving the first chapter of the romance which for them began some 20 years ago. Amy was drawing the lovers who sat apart in a beautiful world of their own, the light of which touched their faces with a grace the little artist could not copy. Beth lay on her sofa, talking cheerily with her old friend, who held her little hand as if he felt that it possessed the power to lead him along the peaceful way she walked. Jo lounged in her favorite low seat, with the grave, quiet look which best became her, and Laurie, leaning on the back of her chair, his chin on a level with her curly head, smiled with his friendliest aspect and nodded at her in the long glass which reflected them both.